Jeremiah Craig coming at ya for another Ask the Bootmaker. Today we are talking with Milan, aka the Mad Tailor, and here he is. Let's do it. Hey, how's it going, Milan? Good. How are you? Great. Good to see ya. Good to see ya. How's your day going? Not bad. Not bad. So where are you calling from? I'm in my shop. Where's your shop? Uh, Lightfish Montana currently. How do you like it there? It's good. What do you mean currently? How how many other places have you had a shop? Uh, that's probably the last place I'm going to move. I was just in New York a few months ago. And now uh, the whole shop is moved here and uh, we live in Montana now. Did you get out of New York in time before the COVID hit there? Oh, just some time. Yeah. Cool. Let's... Get right down to it, because I'm sure people are interested in learning more about the Mad Tailor. Uh, can you give us your origin story as a bootmaker? As a bootmaker, well, here's the story. I uh, uh, when I moved to the states, and uh, I had like this uh, need, you know, to dress myself a little bit better, whatnot. And I found this nice pair of zipper boots. Didn't really know what the brand was, nothing. I just liked the boots a lot. It happened to be a fry boot. And I researched it when uh, all this eBay and stuff like that picked up. I bought every single pair available in the United States in my size. Because it was like the perfect boot for me. And uh, like five pairs. I wore them all out. And uh, then I couldn't find any more of those be uh, boots. And uh, fry didn't make them. I don't know why. Uh, so I started making my own experiments uh, with making some boots. I'm a tailor by trade uh, and a leather crafter, so it was kind of always on my mind. Maybe it's possible to make a boot, but I knew that I have to find a last first. And that was like one of the hardest things to me. Like there's like this guy on the street sold me a pair of last in my side. I was like, I was buying drugs almost. Like. <laughs> <laughs> But I was so happy that that was my very first pair of lasts, and uh, that was like 10 years ago, maybe. And I quickly made a soft boot shape. I don't know, the way I see boots and shoes in general, they're like little jackets. You just have to make them. That's to me, it's like, uh, comes easy by now. I've been doing it for like over 20 years, tailoring and sewing and construction, so. Uh, I kind of see the top, but did not nothing about the bottoms. So I started like researching little by little books, internet, meeting people, trying on my own a lot. I have like tons of scrap shoes and I have like a lot of successful pairs. And uh, little by little, I got confident to make a little bit more. And uh, I always start to make a pair that is exciting. It's like something new about it and to combine the new skills but anyways those fry boots started me i was like i have to make myself a pair and i knocked them out of pretty much like tried to make myself a pair of fry boots like for the lines and everything that they had just used better leather better zippers and all of a sudden end up being a better boot altogether and uh, then i felt like the comfort of wearing like a full sole that is made out of leather versus rubber and all those things and then learn about comfort and I'm a tailor, first of all, so fit is everything. And uh, I claim to know how to fit very well on the body. And then that was interesting to me, how can I do the same thing to the foot? So I have to understand the comfort. And uh, I started making myself a lot of shoes and boots and you name it, and uh, just wear it and tear it and see how it goes. Nice, where did you move from before you moved here to the United States? I'm born and raised in Bulgaria. Okay. The very eastern of Eastern Europe. Awesome. So when you you got into making clothes and being a tailor there? Yes, I started my uh, first experiments, you would call it, back then. I uh, graduated from the Navy Academy and had a master's in green sea navigation, which I pretty much scrapped and uh, pursued fashion because it was very interesting. And uh, yeah, for like about six years, I was doing snowboard jackets and pants 
for my friends and everybody in town. And uh, it was a very good business, very successful. I was making a lot more money than anybody else that had a job. Is that where you got the nickname of Mad Taylor? No, I just came out later when I was already in California and uh, just riding motorcycles and making bike seats and trying to be cool. And it was kind of all the Taylor, as the Mad Taylor, and you go. And that's how it came. So I, I kind of start calling myself. And back in the days before Instagram, I know that there used to be those forums, chat rooms. And we talk about motorcycles all night. And that was my name that I would walk in with and end up being stuck with me. Kind of. I love it. It's a good one. <laughs> so um, what got you interested in boots in the first place? That's a question from Nikos1000 here on Instagram. I think it's a very classy way to cover your feet. It looks, I don't know, it's elegant. It's very elegant. You don't have to necessarily worry about a pair of socks. I don't mind half shoes or whatever you call them, shoes actually, you know, that are short boots. And, um, but a pair of boots when it's made nicely and it fits you and it's like, uh, it just opens up your outfit, finishes you off. And uh, I personally like it uh, just because uh, I like my feet covered and I don't know, uh, it's gear. So I use it all day long. I wear them and tear them. So my feet are protected. I agree 100%. Uh, Christabel Lefleur asks, how long have you been making boots? Seriously, for five years. I, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, interrupt my tailoring business for like, close to two years and solely concentrate on learning the craft of making boots. So uh, I count those two years as a part of those five. But I was like really like dreaming and making boots all day long for two years. Just mistakes, tryouts, and I was kind of doing it by myself and with the help of videos that I can find on the internet and people that were willing to like tell me something. Because I was in Germany at that time and I was like isolated from the States and didn't speak the language and just made boots. Who were some of the people that you reached out to that uh, inspired you to keep making boots? Well, when I start looking at uh, how to make boots, there'll be like a lot of those repair videos come uh, on YouTube and uh, you know, Lisa Sorel's videos, like, uh, I was like, whoa! You know, that's just like, she's practically telling everybody the secrets of uh, what I've been asking myself every day. Right. So I spent just hours watching her, doing her job, and that was like very good influence. And then she happened to have the, the shop and she sent me my first few pairs of lasts. So I started imitating a little bit here and there. It helps that I have a very good shop set up for just about anything. And uh, through the years, I've collected equipment and whatnot to eventually be making boots and now it come handy. Wow, that is so cool that uh, you learned a lot from the Lisa Sorrell, the legend in boot making. Her YouTube is so cool too. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like, it's like uh, you know, sometimes when you feel like you know people, you know, I, I feel like I know her and if I see her in real life, probably like, hey, you know, because I've seen so much of her videos, just everything, you know. <laughs> and you haven't met her yet or anything? Nope. Oh, that'll be great one day. I hope you do get to meet her someday. I hope I get to meet her someday too. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I am curious about your uh, styles and techniques that you have in, your, in being a tailor. And if you've brought any of those to boot making in, in order to incorporate sort of this, this work with fabric into your work with leather? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I say I'm a tailor, also I'm heavily working with garment leather. So I've made like, and keep on making a lot of leather jackets and leather goods. And my job job that I've been doing is like developing and making samples and patterns uh, for companies and designers. 
And, uh, but that's, you know, that's work as I call it, you know, but a lot of these techniques is, I think is the same exact thing, just perhaps using a different type of equipment or, uh, uh, I like to incorporate like, I do a lot of saddle work, a lot of uh, tooling, fancy stitching by hand, like whipping, things that machine cannot do. And if you can apply that to a pair of shoes, it makes it that much more special, I think. Especially if it's a handmade shoe. But what, you know, there's like a very good talent to use the machines in a certain way, to, to control it, to make fancy stitching and all that. That's just mind blowing. That's what's interest me so much into uh, just making the Western type of boots in general. Just the inlay work, the stitching, it's the techniques. It's like, how the hell do you do it? I have to know. I have to try and if I spin the phone around, it's like I have like 13, 14 different machines and I'm a one man show. I don't need that many, but I do have them. Nice. Speaking of the stitching, you have a, a particular style for the welt. Um, I, I spoke with uh, Holly Henry before and she, she used the braided stitched welt and I see that a lot on a lot of your work too. Do you have any boots right by you that you could show with this braided stitched welt? I'm curious to know um, what about it you like so much and that is an example of things that can't be done by a machine, right? Yeah, a machine cannot braid that stitch. Wow. And besides the waterproof and whatever not, it gives a hell of a nice look. So that is, that is waterproof? That waterproofs it to a certain extent. Yeah, once you put the, the little oil and grease and stuff like that, yes, the water is going to be tough to get through in this point. But it looks good. That's what I like more about it. And yeah. it's like super chunky. And that's what Holly did in the first place. She used this cording uh, instead of thread. I used to do it with a very heavy thread. Hold on, let me just show you a heavy, heavy thread. I love the look of that braided stitched well. It's so unique. With, with, with the thread, it's not so pronounced. Oh yeah, I see what you mean. You know, and it loses, if it's not a contrast, this is black on brown, so but it's there but with the with the braid it's a lot more pronounced and it really looks the first time she did it we were like whoa that's incredible so kind of like go with the holy braid you know yeah that's what she, that's what it's named now because when i spoke to her she called it the braided well but you're calling it the holly the holly braid well yeah it, okay it's, you know she was the first one to braid it in a certain way with that thickness and it looks amazing. So I say, hey, I use it. Cool, I dig it. If anybody wants to see that video of me talking to Holly about the braided stitch welts on my YouTube, um, so definitely go check that out because it is an awesome look. I, I love it. Um, I, I gotta get a pair of boots with that someday. <laughs> so I spent so much time stitching it by hand already. You yeah. making the same exact holes. It doesn't take that much more time, but it just looks 10 times better, I think. Yeah, it's it's so unique. I, I And it's functional, too, because it adds more waterproofing from what you're saying. Yeah. It's a piece of leather going one more time right there where the upper meets the, the sole. Love it. Um, so speaking of your business here, and we started out by talking about um, the coronavirus and you getting out of New York, New York City just in time. Has um, coronavirus affected your business right now? Any? Um, or is it pretty much business as usual? I would say it's business as usual since right at this moment, I happen to restructure my entire operation. How so? I mean, I was in New York, I had a shop there, so it's like uh, the way I call it is fishing with a dynamite. <laughs> you know, you sit there, you do your job well, there are people knocking on your door, scratching it, you know, I've, people like bring me food and just stay and work. Uh, but here you have to reach to your customers, create a little bit more uh, 
you got to get to know. I just moved to a town that nobody knows about my skills just yet. And uh, that's what I've been kind of doing and preparing uh, a new website and uh, working on a couple of different products. Uh, so to me, it's business as usual. I'm in the shop working all day long as much as time as I can get because, uh, you know, I have little kids, so they need a little attention. It's easy peasy. So if somebody wanted to order boots from you or anything else from that matter, how would they go about doing that? The best way is to meet me. If you want a real comfortable pair of boots that fits your foot, you know how it gets. It gets measured and you get made up. If you want something off the rack, probably I'm trying to see if I can even like produce something like that because everything that I've done till now, it's been ordered. I've been lucky enough to be busy for like over 20 years and make living out of making things for people. Garments, right now I can make shoes and boots, but you, you name it, I've, I've tried to make it. Belts, bags, accessories, uh, something for the movies that they need to work in certain ways for the theaters with uh, function is something that I like a lot. When something has a reason behind it to be functional and if it looks good, even better. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that you wouldn't make for a customer or you've turned people down for? Uh, that's a question from Clay on Facebook. Pretty much if somebody shows me a picture of something and I'd be like, can you make me these boots? I'm like, why don't you just get them? You have the picture of them. Like, I've been asked to make YSL pair of lookalikes. It's like, I, I won't duplicate somebody's like work or like, I don't think like a off the shelf boot needs to be hand executed in a shop like that. And I believe that everything that's made right now needs to have a purpose. And if I don't find the purpose of it, I won't make it. I don't like to make somebody else's work to replicate it. I would never do that. It's, I like when people replicate mine. I, I feel flattered, but I don't like to. I'm influenced a lot of uh, work out there, phenomenal, and I'm influenced definitely, but I won't go and make it exactly the same. Are your prices comparable to that? We had a question that came through uh, during the live stream uh, while we're talking here. It came from, they basically asked, what are your boot prices? But if somebody asks you to replicate something, is it really, Battle Axe Ranch, the question came from. If somebody asks you to replicate something, um, wouldn't it be more, wouldn't it be more beneficial to them to actually just buy it and cheaper or are your prices on that same level? I would say like if, if you show me a $1,500 pair of boots and you expect me to make it cheaper, it's not going to happen. It's already like in a good price point. It's a designer price point. Something fell. Uh, point, but it's like uh, not... It's already produced, it exists. Maybe it was produced in like limited edition cause uh, I don't know, brands like that do sell out. They have the correct price point to be able to sell their luxurious goods so-called cause they're like manufactured, uh, a lot of synthetic, a lot of gluing. Uh, there's no personal touch to it. Nobody loved it when you grew up. It turned out weird. <laughs> Just like everybody else at a desk. I know what you mean. <laughs> um, speaking of just like everybody else, uh, got a question here from Little Bree. Do you use patterning software uh, for the clothes that you've, like the patterning software, do you use patterning software you've showed for clothes for your boots as well is the question. I have uh, used it. Uh, I don't necessarily um, make such a, like a repetition of a style, let's say, that I necessarily need to use a software. 
Again, I just tried it because it was my extension it's, to me is a pencil. If I'm gonna draw on a computer or draw on a table, it's semi the same. But when you do it by hand, you have more feel about the shape somehow. With the computer, you have. I have a very good intuition with the computer already. I've done it for like the last 15 years. I uh, used to be a professor for tailoring and all that. So software is, I know how to use the software like my pencil. It's easy. I've done it with boots, yes. It works just fine. The accuracy that you can get with the software is crazy. If, you, if I want to make something to fit like zero, 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 run it through the software, make the software, make like the little adjustments, they're microscopic, but they're right there. And then it's perfect. But uh, with boots, I think the element of expansion that we get while we're lasting the, the, the leather, I think the hand feels much better for it. So each letter has like this much expansion. So when you make a pattern, I'd rather just do it quickly. The boot is like usually five, six pieces of pattern. When I use the software, you're talking about 50, 60 pieces into one complete garment. And that's a lot of pieces to control on the table. Yeah, wow. That's crazy. And yeah, every garment like uh, it has pockets and like linings and like little details. And, oh, it's boring. So is that what you like? most about the boots is that there's simplicity and there's more room to work inside that simplicity? There is not a simplicity. Pattern, patterning a boot to me, is, since it's semi-new, I yeah. still enjoy doing it by hand uh, versus completely, I don't do it so much to use the software for it. I enjoy doing it by hand and a lot of the things that I do, I try to even Sometimes I just grab a piece of leather or like an animal that has like armpits and just fits on the last. There's no pattern for that. You just cut it right there and make it to a boot. I put a little bit of uh, intuition into it also and experience of uh, being able to pattern and fit uh, the body. It's, it's very much the same. It's a three-dimensional thinking. And when you understand the dynamics and how a boot needs to clip your leg and like what a clipping leg means and how you feel secure and like how much room you have on the heel there when you walk and what that like when you understand all these things which are interesting to me uh, I think it makes that much better crafter you know because you're going to put all that attention to it yeah no doubt speaking of that sort of intuition do you have any instincts when it comes to the artistry of the boot because I, I that pair that you just showed uh, with the, the the braided stitch welt there, the, the shaft and the tops on that has very intricate designs of Native Americans. So what is your vision when it comes to actually making the design and the art in a boot? Uh, it's always some kind of a crazy idea that I have on the top of my hand. I sketched it once in a while here and there, then you find a notebook. I have three or four around the house and the shop and constantly put the information in there and I've been wanting to, this is part of this new uh, website that I'm kind of building. Uh, so I wanted to make something that's a little bit more wow, you know? And um, I was like, okay, smoking chips, you know, I smoke weed all day long, so why as well, you know? <laughs> and, and I've been having these skins that I've been sitting on for like eight years, this piece of like beautiful, it's called black hippo, but it's actually gray. And it's an amazing texture. It just all flew out together. And uh, they come all right, I would say. Uh, and the interesting thing is I see this soft top, semi. And a very yeah, thick, wow. like, a, like a riding boot. And it's kind of shaped like a little bit like this. So when you wear them, they kind of scrunch on a ankle very nicely. And you can have your pants inside, of course. And it looks nice. It's a, it's a little bit of a different silhouette versus like the hard cowboy boot that is straight up, right? And that's, what is that? That's hair out, right? That's a hair on goat. Hair on goat. It has been distressed and see, it has the same thing. I like to put rubber on some of the boots because you walk on pavement. It's not like you're walking on dirt. And 
you eat up the the sauce in three seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you put the rubber in that hill, uh, not a hill, but the tip, I mean, this thing is like saved my life. It saves the boots. It gives it like another couple of years. Wow. I have boots without, and I just eat through them, right? Here. My one boots, I'm almost, I don't know where they are. These ones right here, I've had these resold six times, um, and they're pretty much done. Like the last time I took them, uh, the cobbler said that they might not even be able to do it another time. So I think I might have to look into doing stuff like that. Yeah, put a piece of rubber on it if you like favorite boot and you like to wear them a lot it just and it's not that slippery and you can get out in the wet i wear my boots rain or not so uh it gets really slippery with the leather soles i almost kill myself a couple times yeah tell me about it me too <laughs> especially on some of the metal grates in the city or whatever we can get so slippery uh, i got another question from buster bernard on instagram what are some trends in boots that you've been asked to make in the last few years or that you've incorporated into the boots that you've made? So some of the trends um, that have influenced you. Oh, I don't really care about trends, honestly. I care what I like and most about the, every customer that I have dealt with is here because they like what I make for myself or like, the style of things that I make for other people uh, and the aspect that we come up together. You know, somebody wants a pair of boots, but then a lot of time they like the little conversation, a little guidance. And once you walk them through a couple of scenarios, they, they feel better. They pick better materials, the be better choice for the end result. So you actually end up making a better boot versus like, not just boot, anything. It's versus making something super crappy and super fast just for the back, you know? You can make a back making something nicer. You have to educate the customer, always. You can't expect uh, somebody to just, I mean, everybody likes good stuff. You know, when you see a nice pair of boots, you cannot deny, this is a nice pair of boots. You may cost 40 bucks, you may cost 4,000, who cares? It's a nice pair of boots. Not who cares, but you know, people like to know who made it, why is it so cool and why is it uh, so popular. So I guess that's them. But what I'm trying to do here is like handmade shoes, one of a kind, a little bit more artistic and involved. You know, I make it for a customer, not for somebody that I don't know. Yep. So that changes the game. It, it changes the outlook of like, you know, that's your baby. You and somebody just create a pair of boots. When you get to know somebody and make a pair of boots for them, do, I mean, I'm sure that they're asking you to make certain things stand out in them, but do you use anything from their personality to incorporate it? Because you are, and you are the artist, they're not the artist. So how do you take their vision and put it into the boots? Throughout conversation, it's always that way. Uh, I've been lucky to just meet about every customer that I had. Uh, very few I've had to do like uh, via Skype or like just email or like it's for somebody that you should not know who it is and just do the measurements, make it. Uh, but it is always uh, applicable to know a little bit about the person it's something on your mind. You're making something for somebody that you actually seen. So you're kind of related already. And I say, if it's a good story, it, it makes a hell of a good pair of whatever it is. I, I completely agree. You got to have a good story. Yeah, you can tell it. the story into the pair of boots. You tell the story into a pair of you know, trousers or jacket or something. This is always a story. You know, everybody can make a normal suit jacket i i'm a trained tailor i know how to make a fucking bespoke shoes but i honestly hate it mm -hmm. it's not personality to be looked into it there's a certain personality but oh don't get me started yep i i know what you mean uh i i think that the story is so important to anything 
Um, for me, when it comes to music, like the story is above all else most important. Um, and I think more people should focus on the story behind things when they're making them, um, just anything. So I respect that 100%. Uh, couple more questions here before we wrap things up. Uh, I'm curious about what you're looking forward to trying in uh, the boot making craft that you are in that you haven't tried yet. So is there anything, is there like that unicorn that you are shooting for um, in boot making? I'm always trying to make my best work and you've heard a million times as good as your last pair of boots but it's like just combining techniques and knowing what's going to happen sometime helps you it's like uh, to me it was some pulling the saw uh, and making the waist tiny it was like why am i wasting flares all the time to one day i saw the motion of Melissa Sorrell's hand, how she does it. I'm saying, oh, that's where you clip it in the waist. And like, that's why it's so tiny. Uh, so it's like those kind of things incorporated with, I don't know, I mean, sewing machines, hand stitches. There's always something in the head, combining all those crafts that uh, and techniques that I enjoy learning and um, perfecting every single day, combining them in the same pot and making one piece of, pair of boots or like a uh, jacket sometimes, it, it, it almost cannot be replicated immediately. You know what I mean? It combines elements from this and that, and it's like hard to be replicated. It's almost like gotcha. that, it's, that's a signature, you know, hey, that's how I make boots and that's how I finish them, or like, that's how I sew jackets. I like the saying that you started that out with, um, you're only as good as your last pair of boots. It's just like the, you're only as good as your last at bat sort of saying it's great. It's perfect. It's exactly correct on everything. Yeah, it takes a lot of effort, not just like to, to learn the, the, the way of making it, to figure it out how it's going to finish the product. Because yes, it is so yeah. close to your uh, 300 bones on your leg or whatever they are. And you don't want to break those feet either. So it's kind of like a little bit more responsibility. I know when you have a tight fitting jacket, you can really suffer your posture. Uh, a lot of people don't even think about it, but you know, when you wear like something that is like so tight on you, you're actually fucking yourself up. Yeah, and no that's doubt. And coming from me wearing and constantly adjusting how you can get motion in your hands and how can you cover the body even better? So yeah, I make things wear and see how they feel and end up looking good too. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so if, uh, if somebody wants to visit your website that you got coming out here soon, what is your URL? Uh, where can people find you online? Oh, it's going to be called madleather.com. Madleather.com. That's a badass URL website name. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And then your Mad Taylor Leather on Instagram. Anywhere else that people can find you? Uh, that's pretty much it. My website, so Mad Taylor Leather, it's pretty much down right now. So I haven't done any work on it. Since Instagram became available, it kind of took away a lot of the old school tools that I was used to, let's say. And... I didn't build my website back in the day. So I had somebody build it for me and uh, I lost that relationship just by costal. It was not working for me. And I was like, I don't know how to do that thing. So I just shut it down for a second and then I was busy just working and it was never about that website anyhow. Thank you so much, Milan, for spending this time with me today. And thanks to everybody for asking the questions. Uh, definitely follow mad taylor leather on instagram he's posting so much you post so much during a day and it's really cool to see your stories and what you're making at the moment i think this is like a way of sharing what you know it, it cannot not share you otherwise you're going to explode and 
you actually learn a lot from people that receive your knowledge too it's like you tell them something and they just click in their head and then the next day they just do it maybe even better than you and like oh how do you do that you know so it's like you check yourself a little bit that way uh, yeah and thank you I, I get a lot of feedback from people like that and i like looking people's stories too and everybody's craft is special to them like singing this is craft that is beyond me playing the guitar will never do it you know have to never learn so <laughs> to me this is like beyond uh, so yeah, it's a constant uh, participation, I would say, in a, in a small community of uh, craft people that we learn from each other. Mm -hmm. No doubt, no doubt. Well, everybody on the stream right now and watching afterwards, go follow Mad Taylor Leather on Instagram because, damn, stories, Instagram feed is just on point all the time. Thank you so much, Milan, for taking this time with me today, and I wish you the best of luck. I'm sure I'll be seeing you around on Instagram. Peace. Thank you. Have a good one.